morning friends. I welcome you to worship this morning in the precious name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Once again we are gathered in our homes, you in yours and I in mine, and the Spirit of God moves amongst us and joins us together as one as we worship God. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 34. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Let's join the Lindley School Junior Choir as we sing together, Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet thy tribute bring. God is with us. Let's approach God in prayer this morning. High King of Heaven and Lord of all creation, as we gather in your name, you still our hearts and our minds. Your gentle touch enables us to open our hearts to your love. You make us aware that you are always with us, always loving us. You are the stable rock on which we can build our lives. You are reliable and trustworthy, and we honour you because you are so good and so kind. We love you with our whole selves because we know without a shadow of doubt that you will never leave us. Nothing can separate us from your love. As your Holy Spirit moves amongst us right now, we are convicted of sin and convinced that even though we have sinned, we are still your beloved children. 
even as we begin our list of confessions. You already know what we have done. There are no surprises waiting for you in what we have thought and said. You have not forgotten what we have forgotten to do. You know and you love the people and the situations that we have avoided. You also know when we have turned a blind eye to evil. Your eyes have seen both us and the evil that we so often leave unchallenged. You do not forget the things that we hoped could be forgotten. You have not forgotten, but even before we have turned from sin and turned to you, before we have asked to be forgiven, you have already forgiven us. In relationship with you, we are loved in a way that is beyond our wildest imagination. We are accepted in a way that overshadows anything that we have ever experienced. We are created and recreated, renewed, restored and reconciled by you. We know you as those who look into a tarnished mirror. And yet, we know that we are fully known by you. Because of your life and your death, your resurrection and your ascension, your promise that you will come again, Jesus, we rejoice in hope. We persevere in faith. We practice love. Meet with us as we worship you today, even as you met with your first disciples, whom you taught to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We rejoice in God's forgiveness as we sing God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. Others will know that I live. 
giving is part of Christian worship. And God invites us to give in order that our hands might become empty enough that we can receive once more. In worship we offer ourselves, our time, our talents. We offer our money and not just our small change. Giving is an expression of our love for God and also of our trust in God who provides for all of our needs. So let's worship God in this way as we sing Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. Gracious and generous God, it is from you that all good gifts come. And this morning we come, bringing our gifts, offering from what you have given to us in order to show our love and our devotion. We pray that you would take our lives, take our hearts, take all that we are, and all that we do, and bless it so that we might be a blessing, and so that your name can be glorified. Amen. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring your love. Where there is Down true faith in you. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there's despair in life, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, only light. And where there's sadness,
much to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand to be loved as to love As we prepare to listen for the Word of God, let us pray. Word of God who was at the beginning, is with us now, and ever will be. We ask that you would help us to stop in our distracted lives, to focus our attention on you, to listen carefully, and not just to listen and to carry on as we were before. Help us, Lord, to be changed by your words and by the touch of your Holy Spirit. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our reading from Scripture this morning comes from Genesis chapter 45, and we pick up the narrative about Joseph when he makes himself known to his brothers. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence! So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one that you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God, he made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, This is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have. I will provide for you there, because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household, and all who belong to you, will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about the honour accorded me in Egypt, and about everything you have seen and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept, and Benjamin embraced him weeping, and he kissed all of his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. One of the most painful and difficult parts of this lockdown period for many people has been the separation that they have had to endure 
even in my own family, several plans to see each other during this year have had to be reworked or cancelled. People have experienced disappointment and a sense of loss in so many different ways. Perhaps we have become a little bit more understanding of those whose families do not always manage to meet together. Families where people live estranged from one another for many years. Families are not perfect and many of us have gone through a variety of experiences with those closest to us. It is said that absence makes the heart grow fonder. It's also true that very often in life we don't appreciate what we have until we no longer have it. And it is with this background, with all of these things in mind, that the reading from Genesis this morning really resonated with me. There have been many major historical events in which people have been separated from their loved ones. Many of these stories don't end with, and they lived happily ever after. The families of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob certainly went through their fair share of turmoil. And this morning we find Joseph sitting in Egypt far away from his father, far away from his family. And I'm sure that there were times that he asked, how on earth did I end up here? There must have been many times in his life that he despaired and felt that there was simply no hope left for him. Certainly his father, on hearing the news that Joseph had been killed, went into deep mourning and really didn't ever get over it. The account of Jacob and his sons is really raw and real, and yet it has so much hope in it as well. I would call it the story of the lost and found family. In today's episode of this family drama, which reads very much like a soapy, we find that Joseph's brothers, who threw him into that pit so long before, who then went and lied to their father about the fact that he had died, find themselves in Joseph's presence. When they had sold Joseph into slavery, I'm quite sure that they never expected that his life could be turned around in the way that it was. And so they do not recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognizes them. I believe as we hear this morning how God worked in these really unfavorable circumstances that we may find things that can help us to deal with where we are right now. Perhaps we have despaired of ever seeing our families again. Perhaps we are like Joseph's father. Surviving, but hardly living. Perhaps the loss and the separation have really become too much for us to bear. If you have found this lockdown period tough, then I believe that God has a word for you and for me this morning. So let's listen up. The trouble in Jacob's family did not begin with him or with Joseph, although they really did have a part to play in how it worked out. The family relationships of those people that we know as the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, were far from perfect. I think if they had to go for assessment today, they would quite definitely have been counted among the dysfunctional families that we find amongst us. Lying seems to have come quite naturally to each one of them. Abram lied about Sarai, and he said that she was his sister, when in fact she was his wife. Isaac also lied about Rebekah, offered her to King Abimelech 
to be part of his harem. Jacob lied about his identity and stole the blessing from his brother Esau. It doesn't seem as if this lying stopped at that point either, because it was so easy for Jacob's sons to come back to him and tell him that Joseph had been killed by a wild animal, when in fact they had sold him into slavery. If we trace the family line, it also becomes quite clear that there is ongoing cheating and stealing and a number of unsettled family feuds along the way. And perhaps what stands out most is the tendency of all the parents to have favorite children. This didn't only come from the side of the fathers, but sadly their mothers were also often involved. The kind of differential treatment that Jacob gave Joseph definitely riled his other sons, and it was this kind of rivalry that pushed them into a position where they felt that they could either kill Joseph or sell him or leave him to rot in a pit. We've all heard about Joseph's coat with its many colours. What we probably don't know as clearly is that it was a coat with long sleeves, which meant that Joseph was not meant to be doing any kind of physical labour. He wasn't going to be working out in the fields with his brothers. Joseph's dreams did come from God, but the way in which he used them to rub his brother's noses in the dirt and even to disrespect his father hardly made him any more popular in the family. The brother's relief comes at the cost of their father's deep mourning, a mourning that is only increased. Jacob's beloved wife, Rebecca, dies whilst giving birth to her second son, Benjamin. How does God bring about healing when our families are in this dreadful estranged state? How can we find comfort during this time where we may actually have nothing to do with the fact that we can't see those that we love? Our reading this morning began with Joseph crying, wailing so loudly that the whole palace could hear him even though he had sent out all the people who were with him, serving at the time. In many cultures, men and particularly strong men or rulers are not allowed to cry. And yet here we find Joseph, Joseph who was ruling over the whole of Egypt, crying and wailing and letting his tears come. When we fight back the tears, when we refuse to acknowledge the feelings that go together with being separated from those that we love, we really do ourselves and God a disservice. Joseph was totally overcome with emotion, and I can only guess what was going through his mind at that time. How tangled up his emotions must have been. There must have been relief and joy at seeing his brothers. He must also have experienced dreadful anger, especially when they didn't even recognize him and there was no apology forthcoming. We really hear the cry of Joseph's heart when he says to his brothers, Is my father still living? People going through bereavement during this time of lockdown or isolation or staying safe really have had a very, very difficult time dealing with their grief because all the usual support systems, all the ways that we have of saying goodbye to those that we love have really been put on hold in order to keep people safe. There has been so much talk about the economy that is collapsing, 
So much talk about our failing healthcare system. So much concern about the corruption in our government and in the people supplying all the things needed during this time. All of these are very valid concerns, as is the concern of keeping people safe during this time. One of the things that is very real, but that we don't hear nearly as much about, is the emotional cost of what is happening to those people who are going through prolonged anxiety, those people who do not have people with them in the house, those people and their families who have sacrificed themselves in order to be available to look after others. Joseph was very busy managing the economy of Egypt and supplying food to all those who were starving at that time. He could easily have turned the situation into a chance to get back at his brothers. And yet the thing that Joseph does first, and that we hear about, is that Joseph weeps. Even at the end of this morning's reading, Joseph is crying on the shoulder of Benjamin, and Benjamin is crying too. What feelings have you been bottling up during this time? What tears have you held back and not allowed to flow? Are, as one person put it, important in healing the soul. After living with so many lies for so very long, both Joseph and his brothers have to come clean. Joseph reveals his identity to his brothers. And after all that they have done to him, it's no doubt that they are terrified, especially since he holds such power at this time. Joseph also forces his brothers into having to go and confess to their father that Joseph is indeed alive and doing well and would like to see him. It seems that no one in Pharaoh's court knew anything about Joseph's loss, about his being sold into slavery, about how much he missed his family. Whilst Joseph's brothers have to admit that Joseph's dreams have come true, that they are now bowing before him because they are in such need, in such dire circumstances. Joseph not only has to reveal his identity, Joseph has to reveal his heart. I know of many people who have been through really difficult times during this lockdown, and many people who have tried very hard not to actually say how it is affecting them. They don't want to worry their family. They don't want to be a burden. Some people don't even want to be honest with themselves about how frightened they are, about maybe not seeing their family, or maybe losing their job, or losing their identity. I wonder what it is that you and I have been holding inside us. What have we been lying about to ourselves and to others during this time. Today is the time to come clean if we want to find healing and restoration from God. My late mother told us how she as a little girl had been staying with her grandparents in Sweden just before the Second World War broke out. She, in fact, boarded a boat the night before the Second World War was declared. Her entire trip home had to be kept secret. No one could know about the whereabouts of the boat that she was on. And so it was that she arrived home in South Africa and walked up the garden path unannounced. 
my grandmother, who was hanging up washing at the time, looked up and she blinked her eyes. And she looked again and then she said, Charlotta, is it really you? It seems as if Joseph's brothers had a similar experience when Joseph told them who he was. Joseph invited them to come closer, to look at him, to see him clearly, to come into his circle of influence. We have been hearing a great deal in the last months about how we need to socially distance ourselves from other people. And I'm not wanting to undermine that in any way. We do need to be mindful of how our health can influence the health of other people around us. Other people who are perhaps more vulnerable than we are. But how do we manage the loneliness, the fear, the uncertainty, the sense that perhaps we will never be reunited? How can we see when our eyes are filled with tears and our hearts are petrified? Joseph invites his brothers and he says, come closer. Come closer are key words for us at this time too. First of all, there is a need for us to come closer to God, to open our lives more fully to God's touch. To express our fears and our feelings in ways that perhaps are unfamiliar because we have been taught to pray in such stilted ways. The more physically we are distanced from one another, the more we also need to actually work at coming closer, speaking with one another, telling our friends, our closest friends and our families what is really happening inside of us. Some of us may even need to come closer to ourselves, to admit to ourselves that we struggle with bodies that are not actually as strong as we wish they were, to admit to ourselves that our feelings can be overwhelming and we don't know how to handle them particularly well. When we cannot meet physically, it also becomes all the more important to come closer as we carry those people that we love in our prayers and in our hearts to God. This episode of the Lost and Found Family ends with some remarkable words. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. I wonder if Joseph and his brothers had ever actually had any kind of civil conversation with one another. It seems that from the very beginning, their relationship was doomed. And yet God has ways of working in our families, our very ordinary, sometimes very broken families. God has ways to work in us. And so we need to let our tears come. We need to come clean about the things that we are hiding or lying about. And we need to draw near, to come closer to God and to come closer to one another. In Christ, God is reconciling the world to himself. In Christ, we can face ourselves and we can face one another. In Christ, we are able to let our tears come. In Christ, we are able to come clean about the things that we are hiding from and the things that we are lying about. In Christ, we can come closer. Joseph was called to make provision for his family 
and it meant that he had to go down to Egypt as a slave. He suffered a great deal before he was made assistant to Pharaoh. We too may be called to uncomfortable and difficult circumstances. We may not want to reconcile with certain people, and yet this is the work of God, and to this we are called. Amen. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name, your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering Though there's pain in the offering Blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to praise When the darkness closes in, Lord Still I will say Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, oh you give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be, blessed be, blessed be your name. Always. Almighty God. You love us with a love that is stronger than death. And so we come to you this morning to offer you our thanks and to pray for your world. We thank you for the blessings of this past week, for the people who are dear to us, for new days, new learning, new experiences new opportunities to be a blessing to one another. We thank you that you brought healing to Jacob's broken family and we trust that you will bring healing to us too today. We pray for those people who are finding this period of lockdown, this period of anxiety and uncertainty so very difficult. And we ask that you would draw close to them 
that you would embrace them in your love and that you would hold them close, that they would know that they are not alone. We pray for people who have lost family members and friends and who have not been able to come together in order to mourn. We pray for those people who have lost their livelihoods, lost their jobs, or lost their identity because they no longer are able to do what they were doing before. We ask that you would provide for these people and we also ask that you would restore their hope and their dignity. We as your church at this time have not always managed to do the things that you would want us to do and so we ask for courage for strength and for wisdom to be able to minister in these days. Lord, you know what is needed and we know that you lead us. And so we ask that you would also love others through us. We ask for your healing for all who are seriously ill at this time. We also ask for healing of relationships healing of people who have been abused, women who have been trodden down and not respected and not given the opportunities that they should have been given. We pray that we would see these people through your eyes and that you would help us to be reconciled with those from whom we are at present alienated. We pray for all those who lead and those who serve at this time. We pray together, God bless Africa, guard her children, guide her leaders and give her peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices. It's an appropriate hymn for today. It acknowledges that God blesses us on our way, right from the time that we are in our mother's arms. And so it acknowledges the blessing that mothers are in our lives. It's also appropriate because it was written by a pastor in 1637 during the time that a plague claimed the lives of 8,000 people in the town that he was living in and ministering in. During the peak of the plague, he was burying 40 to 50 people a day and yet he remained well. After the plague, came an extreme famine. Pastor Rinkart gave away all that he had, keeping only the bare minimum rations for his own family. It is only by God's grace that he could write these words during that awful time. Perhaps his words will encourage our hearts as we join our voices and sing together.
receive God's blessing. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest on you and remain with you and all those you love, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen and Amen. Thank you.